My father served in the military for 24 years before he retired. I moved to a town in the heart of the Midwest. After two years, my father became restless. Despite our financial stability after he retired, and my mother worked as an accountant and tax preparer, he felt the need to work again. He held various positions at local service stations. Given the close-knit nature of the town, the station owners had no qualms about helping me with such tasks as restocking shelves and managing the register, as long as I refrained from selling alcohol or tobacco. This story unfolds in the late 70s and early 80s. The specific incident I'm about to recount took place in the year 1982, a memory etched in my mind due to the proximity of my birthday. At the time, I was 15 years old and had just obtained my learning permit. My father used this opportunity to let me drive to and from work, which allowed me to gain valuable driving experience. One evening, however, I was sitting in my usual place by the window, immersed in a book, feet up, with soft drinks and snacks on the table. My routine usually involved alternating between reading, helping with the log, and restocking the cooler. My attention was suddenly caught on my book by an unusual sight. I noticed a woman walking across our parking lot, coming from the direction of the nearby freeway. This struck me as strange because pedestrian traffic was scarce in our vicinity, especially from the direction of the highway. I assumed her car broke down and tried to use our phone for help. I didn't know how wrong I was. I entered the store, and her presence gave me a strange sensation. She wandered around briefly before approaching the table to engage my father in conversation. Her story revolves around her being stuck and needing a ride to the bigger city to the north of us, known as Greenfield. My father explained his commitment to the business, making it clear he couldn't help it. When she turned her gaze towards me, my father's head shaking signaled his caution. Confused, I was ready to oblige until my father, who usually reacts warmly to clients, showed uncharacteristic nervousness and caution. Turns out, he sensed something wrong with her from the moment I got off the highway. Irritated by my father's refusal, the woman directed her anger at me, asking if I might be her chauffeur. My father immediately replied that my student permit legally prohibited me from driving unaccompanied. Though I might have considered breaking the rules on another occasion, my father's uncommon sternness dissuaded me from arguing. His intuition triggered an inner feeling that this woman was dangerous. Frustrated, she hurled a few curses at my father before he ushered her out of the store, slamming the door hard behind her. The glass panel seemed close to shattering due to the impact. She walked away, her steps back toward the highway, and finally disappeared onto the northbound slope. Almost a year had passed, and I was in my room, about a week before my 16th birthday, when my father's urgent voice echoed from the living room. Rushing to find out why he was so excited, I found him pointing at the TV. The image on the screen was a snapshot of a woman from that fateful night. Immediately I remembered the creepy customer from the gas station. It turns out that I narrowly avoided riding Aileen Warnos, who later faced conviction as a serial killer, and met her fate on death row. The realization kept haunting me as I grappled with the terrifying possibilities of what could happen. Don't miss out on the bone-chilling thrills. Subscribe now and prepare to be haunted by the horrors that await. About five years ago, my colleague Lachlan and I found ourselves in my family's lodge. We made a plan to visit a casino located on the Quinault Indian Reservation, which was about a 30-minute drive away. The entire stretch of road between the inn and the casino was lined with thick woods and devoid of any street lighting, creating a semi-dark environment. After arriving at the casino, we engaged in some poker, tried our luck at various table games, and treated ourselves to a satisfying meal with our casino winnings. It turned out to be a successful evening for both of us. We decided to leave the casino close to 1 a.m., a little later than I had thought. When we set out on the return trip, the lack of streetlights made driving scary. We drove down the highway for about 20 minutes without encountering any other vehicles. Seeing a pair of luminous emerald orbs on the side of the road before a cliff, I suddenly hit the brakes, realizing that they belonged to deer. We waited while several deer crossed the road and then continued on our way. The car was moving slowly uphill due to starting from a standstill. When we reached the top of the hill, Lachlan suddenly exclaimed, Whoa, my God! Right in front of us, right in the middle of our path, 
was a young woman walking toward us, no more than 30 feet away. I hit the brakes again, bringing the car 10 feet away from her. Fortunately, the previous slowdown and uphill climb prevented us from traveling at high speed. My mind, however, was not preoccupied with the fact that I had narrowly avoided striking someone. Instead, I was struck by the image of this young woman with jet black hair, wearing a white nightgown, barefoot, still advancing toward us with a blank expression. I admit that picture terrified me, like something out of a horror flick. Lachlan and I hesitated, waiting to see if she would approach the car window, perhaps call for help. I got to the front of my car, then swerved around the driver's side. Although she didn't stop, she just raised her hand and stepped on the side of my car as she continued walking. At this point, Shalon and I were absolutely freaked out. I had consulted Lachlan as to what to do next. He urged me to leave. However, for reasons I couldn't fully comprehend, I didn't feel comfortable leaving without checking her safety. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I noticed she was still walking. Seeing the near collision and the anxious atmosphere, I made a decision. I told Lachlan I intended to inquire if she was alright. Lachlan implored us to leave, but I put on a facade of courage, assuring him it would be alright and that I would be back soon. I activated the hazard lights and exited the vehicle, leaving the door open for the illumination. I wandered around the back of the car, though the interior lights provided limited visibility and flashed erratically. They provided enough light to distinguish her silhouette, sloping slightly, with glimpses every second. I exclaimed, Are you okay? Eventually she stopped her walk but continued to face away from us. No response reached my ears. In the midst of Tom getting ready to join me, her sudden shrieks pierced the air. Lachlan and I rushed to the car, and I accelerated quickly. Lachlan took the opportunity to taunt me through the rest of the ride back to the inn. Since that incident, I have not encountered or heard of anything similar along that highway and I am sincerely grateful for that. It represents the most chilling episode of my life. A few years ago, I was driving through a remote area in the heartland of New Mexico, en route to visit my father. In the distance, I spotted a figure standing by the roadside, hitchhiking. He was gesturing for a ride, donned in worn-out desert camouflage pants, and a military cap adorned with intricate insignia and unit details. Although I'm not well versed in military matters, there was an air of a seasoned veteran about him. Out of respect, I decided to extend a helping hand and offer him a ride. I overtook him momentarily, pulled my car to the side, and signaled him to approach through my open window. As he drew closer, I watched through the rearview mirror as he struggled with two bulky bags, dragging them along the road. Eventually, he hoisted them into the back of my car. His appearance was weathered, and there was a faint odor, suggesting a possibility of homelessness or a cross-country journey to embark on a new chapter in his life. After he settled into the passenger seat, we exchanged some casual banter. Curiosity got the best of me, and I inquired about his military service. Surprisingly, he responded, No, never served a day. His demeanor was detached and aloof and I began to sense that I might have made a grave misjudgment in offering him a ride. Despite my attempts to spark conversation, our interaction remained shallow, and I chose to focus on driving. As minutes ticked by on the open road, my intrigue grew about the contents of his bags. They were clearly heavy, judging by the effort he exerted while loading them into the car. Unable to contain my curiosity, I queried, What do you have back there? For the first time, he turned to me, locking his gaze onto mine, and sternly retorted, None of your concern. This response sent shivers down my spine, raising the unsettling possibility that he might be in possession of something illicit. While apprehensive, I reminded myself of my own physical stature and capability. Deciding to confront the situation head-on, I pressed further, making it evident that my inquiry wasn't mere chatter, but a genuine concern for my safety. While I empathized with his situation, my personal security took precedence. He repeated his response with greater emphasis. None of your concern. At that moment, I decided to abruptly break, immediately noticing his hand inching towards his belt. Though he didn't retrieve any object, the gesture hinted at an alarming escalation of danger. Composing myself, 
I calmly advised him to exit the car unless he wanted me to call the authorities. I offered him a chance to extricate himself from the situation without involving the police. It was a fair proposition, contingent on his level of desperation. There was a lingering dread that he might resort to violence, forcing me out, taking control of my car, leaving me stranded, and by the time help arrived, it would be too late. His hand grazed his belt once more, as if contemplating his next move. Then, seemingly guided by a moment of clarity, he opted to comply and agreed to leave. With vigilant eyes trained on him, I watched as he retrieved his belongings from the back seat. My instincts suggested he wasn't a murderer. The bags didn't emit any gruesome odors. In fact, they seemed rather innocuous. He didn't emanate malice, yet his involvement in whatever transpired was a realm I wished to remain far from. As he closed the car door with a thud, I floored the accelerator, putting distance between us. Over the years, I had provided rides to numerous hitchhikers, always striving to extend kindness to those in need. However, this encounter was a stark reminder that not every encounter unfolds in a harmonious tune. It illuminated the fact that behind the act of picking up a stranger lies a complex tapestry of unknowns, caution, and a world beyond the surface.